Uh, well, thank you, Professor Paul Raj, for meeting with us. Really grateful for you taking the time. You're welcome. Um, and uh, just to inter introduce myself, I'm, uh, I graduated from Stanford, undergrad, master's, PhD, and I, uh, uh, I've been working on entrepreneurship. And so I actually initiated the meeting look, just looking for general advice because I remember I met you a couple sure. times. Uh, but then uh, I got the idea of making it into a podcast. So I thought that would be fun. Um, Daniel, do you want to... Yeah. So, yeah, I'm actually really excited about interviewing you. I feel like uh, you're the first interviewer uh, that we're, we're doing this podcast with. Interviewee. Yeah. Interviewee, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm Daniel Kivitinos. I'm uh, a transplant from New York. You know, the goal of interviewing you is to see and sort of pick your brain on, like, what uh, sort of, like, your life and, and the experiences you've had. And to kind of learn learn from you. Yeah, and like, kind of share, yeah. share your wisdom. <laughs> cool, sure. Yeah. <laughs> when you developed um, multiple input, multiple output uh, technology, um, and that's uh, kind of a key to the 4G, and the LTE, and some right. Wi Fi network, uh, what was your creative approach on, on trying to invent that technology? Let me go back a little bit about my own career. I spent actually most of my career in India. In the I, Navy, right? in, uh, I was Indian Navy, but I was never, you know, I was never driving ships. I was always in labs and stuff. Uh, R and D, yeah, because mostly were, D. You were le leading labs. Like yeah, I was. Uh, I actually, I was my first. Uh, I did uh, I, for, for, for ten years. I was uh, uh, the guy in India building military sonar systems. Now we had a war with Pakistan, and uh, we lost a ship due to anti-submarine action. So uh, those days, you know, even today, a lot of Indian military equipment is imported. We buy it from, those days we bought them from UK, but now we tend to buy it from Russia, uh, in, increasingly from the United States now. But uh, in 71, we had a war with Pakistan, and uh, those days our ships were largely UK. And our top ship, anti submarine ship, was torpedoed. And uh, that turned a big shock. We lost a lot of lives. And so I was, this, uh, I was doing a, I was on kind of deputation doing a PhD at IIT Delhi, one of the good yeah, schools in Delhi. India. Yeah. I was there only for two years. I was only given two years. So I was back at the, with the naval headquarters when uh, you know, we had this war. And so they asked me, can you do anything about the sonar, which had obviously not detected a submarine. So I just went back to the university happily and then did a project there, which became very successful. We built a new sonar inside the university. Not easy to do, you know, but we managed to do it. That, and that, that was, was the APO. Uh, no, that was earlier. Uh, AP, that was sorry. sonar one seven zero B. One seven zero B, which is the British name. We sort of took the sonar, uh, threw out all the electronics, kept the transducer and all the heavy engineering part. We didn't want to touch that, but all the electronics we sort of modified it. We changed the waveforms, the signal processing. It was a big success, and we sort of improved the performance dramatically, and came up with some very nice ideas. So, and uh, so that was then productionized and put into all the ships. That was a two-year kind of a project, and I spent a year in England, uh, you know, uh, working as a research scholar. And then I came back, and uh, and India was looking at really top, uh, of, uh, you know, uh, a world-class fleet sonar for its, because uh, this sonar we I, I sort of modified or improved was the searchlight sonar which is like, you know, ping, receive, ping, receive, step, step, step. It's very slow in doing a scan. Mm. So you want to really transmit all around and get back all around. It's called, it called panoramic sonar. So that was the kind of the stand of state of the art. So we, we were looking for a state of the art sonar. And I think uh, we actually were interested in the, uh, the American one, but uh, we, wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't get it from the United States want to sell it to us. So I landed up, I said, no, let's build it on our own. And that was the Absurd project. And that was a very successful system. That took about six years to build. And that was modeled off the U.S. technology? No, or? it was really our ideas. Yeah. Basically, my, you know, I was the, kind of the, the in charge of the project, uh, project leader. It's just, you know, ideas coming out of my brain. Because <laughs> we had access to what the Russians were doing, because we had a lot of Russian sonars by that time. But uh, we also seen Europe and uh, Americans, so we didn't have very much idea of what we have I think sonar are very classified, you know, pretty secret stuff. And the sonar was mainly for the, the ships and under the water. Yeah, and this was a uh, surface ship sonar, which is either operating off a transducer, which is below the ship, or uh, in, a sh in, in a fish, which is towed uh, hundreds of feet in the water. Mm. It's, it's like a, looks like a dirigible balloon, one of those kinds of sea up there. 
but it's, it's in metal casing, it's stored deep, deep in the water. That's because uh, propagation of sound in the water has lots of problems, and uh, by going deeper, you get better ranges and so on. So it's called variable depth sonar, VDS. So we had those kinds of transducers, and these transducers were massive, and they would cost 15, 20 tons of equipment, you know, a big, di you know, five, six feet diameter and about seven feet tall, containing hundreds of elements of transducers. So this is the uh, transducers part, which is the uh, thing, but all the electronics was inside the ship. And uh, so that is a very big, very, very big project. Uh, hundreds of man years of effort and very, very successful. And I think, you know, there's certainly anything better than anything we saw in Russia or Europe, but we really couldn't compare with American, but I thought we were better than... Uh, the American fleet sonar those days was uh, was sonar called SQS-56. We had some idea what it was doing, but I thought we were probably very comparable, if not better. And better than Pakistan. Big pun? And better than Pakistan. Oh, Pakistan. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I never had anything like that. <laughs> so, uh, so we were... Uh, so this was very successful and became became India's really first major success in electronics for the country itself, not only not only for the sonars, for the country. And, and that was before the big IT boom. Much well before, well before. Yeah. And in fact, this was the seventies. Was this the seventies when this you were was working? between seventy-seven to eighty-three? Okay, eighty-three. And the IT boom started uh, a little bit about uh, towards the uh, end of eighties, end of eighties, and. Uh, so, so this actually gave, I think, uh, the confidence in India that we can build in our world-class systems. And for some reason, the word world-class is always pinned on the sonar, saying this is really state-of-the-art. And, and, uh, and so uh, that was very, very successful. And as a result of that, uh, the Indian government that time, Mrs. Indira Gandhi was the prime minister. Uh, Indira Gandhi, might, she was assassinated later. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. A lady. Yeah, so a very strong, strong woman. And she knew me and she said, you know, why don't you uh, wanted me to spend some time abroad? So I had spent a brief time briefly in UK at Loughborough University earlier after my first project and uh, the first sonar project. So this time I said I wanted to go back there, but somebody in his wisdom said, you know, I've been to Stanford, it's a great campus, why don't you go there? I know, do you know anybody there? I said, yes, I do know someone, somebody called Professor Thomas Kala, who is a professor here. So he said, why don't you ask him and go there? And we would pay for it. The Indian government would pay for it. So I wrote to him and he said, no. He said, uh, you know, he, had, he was my uh, external examiner for my PhD thesis. In, in India, we sent the thesis out to foreign examiners because, you know, to get more feedback. Didn't, unlike at Stanford, you know, examiners right here. Totally internal. So yeah. mine had come here. And that was a very, very, I did some thesis in uh, in uh, in. Uh, and signal, uh, you know, estimation of signals and random noise, random signals and noise, and um, nonlinear estimations. I used the tools of stochastic calculus, very, very esoteric stuff. Stochastic calculus. I don't know if you've, you've dealt with it, but it's not. It's not d by dx of x squared is not two x. Something else. <laughs> it deals with uh, functions which are nowhere, everywhere continuous, but nowhere differentiable. But uh, so using those tools, I uh, had a very, very successful thesis. It was very, you know, it, it had, it had. Uh, unified the whole area very well and predicted a lot of new results. So that was very good and so at that time he asked me to come and teach a course at Stanford uh, on thesis. He was very impressed. And Berkeley had somebody, a professor, who was also said why don't you come there, Eugene Wong. But when I went to Indian government, they, I was a lieutenant in the Navy and they said there's no way you're going to the United States. So, you know, the U.S. was a big enemy of, United States, of India. So you yeah. guys had uh, mm. sided with Pakistan and uh, mm. so they said no, you're not going to can't go there. But many years later, that is, that was in '74. But in '83, when I finished this project, uh, when, when of course things had improved, and uh, and uh, so um, uh, I wrote back to Stanford saying, "Can I come in?" And Pascal said, "No." But then I sort of wrote back to him once again saying, "You know, why don't, why don't I show up?" In, in fact, my bosses in you and in India were saying, "You should go to Stanford. It's a nice university." Uh, I know I've been to the United States before. At that I probably had been not been to Stanford. So. I wrote back a couple of times, and I'm free. You know, I was paid for. So finally, Tom said, I had to come along. And um, so I was here for, I thought I'd spend a year and a half, but I think I spent more than two years here. And I switched back from all this practical stuff back to pure theoretical stuff, mathematical stuff. And at that time, the group was working on a very interesting problem. It's ultimately, ultimately sort of led to my mind, my idea, in my thinking. Where we have a number of antennas, uh, uh, radio antennas, the signals are arriving at them from different directions. 
multiple signals, what is the direction of those signals? Estimate that problem. It turned out uh, there was a long history of that problem. There were probably about 50 a PhD thesis on that. And there were a few well-known results here and now and then, and uh, the breakthrough ideas. And uh, when I landed here, just before I landed, there was a guy called Ralph Schmidt in the Valley. He worked, I think, at ESL, who had a very fundamental idea called the music algorithm. Very nice piece of mathematics, you know, uh, using uh, subspaces and manifolds. Beautiful piece of math, which is really it caught fire. And his paper was one of the most cited papers at that time. So when I came here, I started looking at that problem, and so looking at his approach and working around it. Uh, make it make, make it solve more complicated problems and so on and so forth. Did you go meet him in person? Oh yeah, I knew Ralph very well, extremely yeah. well, and uh, he's a brilliant guy. I lost touch with him now, but uh, I do remember you know later getting him sponsored for a IEEE fellowship and things like that. I knew Ralph well, and uh, so I was uh, here, and I was I was I need to go back to India. I was still, at that time I was a naval captain in the Indian Navy, and um, but then one uh, but then uh, when I built that sonar. After so now, we were we also had uh, mechanisms for finding out the direction of submarines. Uh, the, the sonar was active and passive, so passive means only listening to submarine sound. On the passive side, we would be able to listen to submarine, localize the direction of submarine, and sometimes track it and so on and so forth. And there was looking at the ideas there about how to do it, different approaches. And uh, and finally, we landed up with an approach which turned out to be the right thing to do. But we had explored other ideas. So when I came here, uh, we were, the problem was very similar here, except we have multiple signals coming in. So the problem was a little different. So there was a core mathematical problem to be solved. And I was, I was uh, going back to my absurd days, so I was trying to see how do I translate the ideas here. And I was uh, sort of trying to get to it for many months. I was holding it in my, my head for many months. Finally, one day it cracked, uh, 2 o'clock in the morning. I was actually at the office at Stanford when I was working on it. An idea came and it took only a few minutes so it actually works. As can we call the dub that thing called Esprit, the angle uh, Esprit. And it turned out to be a pretty big revolution. It was a, it's come, so for the last 30, 40 years, people have looked at looked at this problem in one way, and this is a totally different way. And um, and uh, so everybody looked at it and said, you know, this is a, this is a total breakthrough idea. And it was this concept of like multiple antennas at the end it, Yes, they still had the idea of antennas, but the, the, the thing that Esprit worked out was it showed that you, you form something called matrix pencil, uh, uh, matrix pencil, and the, or generalized eigenvalues of certain matrix pencil where the answer, where the, what you're looking for. So, well, all the earlier system, you had to plot a spectrum and look for the peaks, and that would tell, peaks tell you the directions. And they had all the problems of biases and variance. This was more efficient, it met the frame of bound. So, so this is actually a totally new idea, and it really just took off. You know, it became, SP became like uh, earlier music, became, you know, darling, and I think there are thousands of papers now on SP. I barely had this idea, we published, we first presented it in, in a conference in SLMA, and my time was up at Stanford, and I went back to India. And one of the students of Tom, called Richard Roy, a very bright guy, he went on to build around Esprit, wrote a thesis on it, and he took, he took it over and went forward. So when, you had the concept and he implemented yeah, it? Yeah, I had the concept and, you know, we wrote the first paper together, but, you know, Professor Kailak was the, was the group head, so his name was always on the paper. So I was the first author, because I had the idea, and, and Richard Roy helped me with simulations and things like that. Later on, he did some advancements on his own and so on and so forth. But I went back to India and I was... Uh, Back here, yeah, I was back, I was still in uniform, but uh, I was not going to back to the ship, so I needed to do something, do some D. I always say in India, we don't need R, we, we need D. Just we need to build some stuff, stuff mm. in this country. <laughs> Forget about research. So anyway, so I was then asked to take over a very large electronics warfare lab. You know, we have a large lab, probably 5,000 people, scientists, and I was pretty young. In New for, Delhi? Or? It was, this was in Hyderabad. Oh, okay. So this is a, a, a very large lab. And um, and um, say so the government said, "I didn't take it over and run it as a director." I was a little uh, unkeen. I was pretty young. Uh, I think the average age of the lab was ten years older to me. Average age, leave alone. Mm. So in India, age matters. You know, it's a more traditional society. So I thought I would have a lot of flack. And a lot of people said, "Don't do it. Start something on your own." I managed to using the leverage of the navy to tell the government that let me start a new lab. And so I started a lab in AI and robotics. In terms of those days, we were going through a hype cycle in AI here. And, uh, mm -hmm. So when I was at Stanford, though I was working in signal processing, I, was, I used to attend some AI conferences. 
Feigenbaum who lives nearby, you know, was there and so on and so forth. You knew John McCarthy? And John McCarthy was, I didn't meet him, but I did know Feigenbaum. I knew a few more people. And I, I knew another professor in Cunningham Medical, Raj Reddy, who's a very well, robotics guy. So I said, you know, this, this is still far away for India, but let's start it and build a group. Eventually, we will do something with it. So I started the lab, and uh, but very quickly, India just just then started a big program on uh, uh, on to build our own fighter jet, you know, fighter combat jet, like F-16 equivalent type system. We were buying those days. We were buying our fighter jets from uh, mainly from a uh, little bit the older versions from from the, from the MiGs from Russia, and we were buying them from France, Mirage. And uh, but we wanted to build our own. Uh, you know, spending a lot of budget on this. So, so that was already started, and but uh, till, at that time, the only guy who delivered a big system, you know, it's had proven, gone to production, was used by the armed forces was me, the Sona, APSA Sona. So the government in their wisdom said, you know, you are the guy who can do something with this program, so why don't you take it over? So I had, you know, I had no idea of, of, of aeronautics or aviation or... Uh, so I said, you know, I'll do it, but... Uh, so I spent a, almost a year going to Air Force bases, flying in aircraft. Uh, so it started out as an artificial intelligence lab, but then you switched to the... I was, I, I was just running the lab performer. Essentially, I was mm-hmm. not, I knew my real job was that. So, oh, okay. so I was taking yeah. time. I was not doing much in the lab. That was the main objective. Yeah. To, yeah. So I started getting some flying experience, uh, going to uh, Indian Air Force. Uh, we, had, we, had, we had mirages, we had, uh, we had the uh, Sea Kings, which were the, which was a... Uh, uh, which was the Sikorsky helicopters. We had a lot of aircraft all over the world. I was getting familiar with them. Try to understand uh, the psyche of Air Force people. And one thing that always struck me at that time was I needed to get an Air Force officer to run this program. I can be the kind of the chief engineer, but I needed a guy who was an Air Force guy because my worry was that uh, this aircraft could kill people, test pilots. You know, and Test pilots are the most mm. important people in Air Force. If it kills a test pilot... Indian test pilot in you know, the Air Force walked away from the aircraft because somehow I sort of had that feeling. Mm. So I was lobbying the air, air chief. Now here I don't call them, I don't problem call them here. We call them chief of the Air Force to give me a very bright, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think one star general from the Air Force to run this program. As I'll report to him, but I will be the I'll be the technical guy. So all this was going on, and, and the Air Force didn't, was skeptical about what we were doing. The these tensions were there. At some point, uh, the Navy uh, uh, and I wanted to change the structure of the program. You know, uh, uh, take it out of the government somewhat. Yeah. Quick question: The Air Force guy was needed to basically make the project sort of safer for the test pilot, or no, to, no, to no, sort no, of make, it make the pilot the... make the Air Force own the program. Own the program. Okay. So There's our, our aircraft. But he would, you oh, were building right. it, and if they died <coughs> or got hurt, it would be from yeah, your the, team. The, it's Air Force, so they buy into it <coughs> emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. Then, you know, like in the APSO project also, <coughs> it was though I was the head of the thing. It was, I did it under the uh, government uh, lab. The Navy had a lot of investment in it. You know, Naval Chief would uh, would not let that program die because he really needed that SONA. So he did a lot of battle, all the political, lot of politics and these things to make sure the Navy gets that. So I, I, I saw that model. Otherwise, it never, the episode never survived all the politics without Navy being 100% behind it. Saying, I want this thing and I'm prepared to cut any, chop any amount of heads to make it happen. And of course, it, it helped them that I was a naval officer myself, so I was running the program. But there were lots of politics, and part hey, of what mm. gives them that motivation is like, hey, we internally generated this. And yeah, we and as well as you know, problem. when the opposition comes from somewhere else, and if we saw opposition, they would chop the heads, you know, saying that you know we don't want any, and this this program has to succeed. So later, I always felt the Air Force must own this program, and they need to defend this aircraft, and. Even and then it might kill a peep, some people, but they will be behind it. Mm. So that was been part of it. But I want structuring the program, take it out of the government. You know, there was ridiculous uh, bureaucracy. India is very bureaucratic. I'm immensely bureaucratic. You know, mm. we talk about bureaucracy in our country here as <laughs> difficult. It's far worse in India. Mm. <laughs> so I want to take that to change the structure. Eventually, you know, I used to go to Delhi every every week. Uh, I was in Bangalore. It was about uh, two hours south of Bangalore to try and push the papers forward. But eventually I began to feel that, you know, there were lots of people opposing things. And so I, then I went, told the Naval Chief that I don't think this is going anywhere. 
So maybe I should come back to the Navy and build some submarines for you, something like that. So he, he pulled me out, but uh, there was no project for me to run in the Navy. So I was sent to a large defense electronics manufacturing company called Bharat Electronics. They do all the radars and sonar. They actually manufacture the sonar that I designed. So they were a big manufacturing company. Largely, their business model was to buy the design from outside, from Raytheon or from uh, maybe Ericsson, and, and manufacture it for India to add some internal value. But the design would come outside. So then they have went, I was posted there as director of R&D for them. So, so they had a large group of people I was running, but I also had I built some labs called Central Research Labs, some more fundamental labs where we're not directly doing product development, but doing a little bit advanced development, building some more skill sets to get away from the mindset of importing technology, but creating our own technology. I was, so I was there for two years, and uh, meanwhile, the Indian government was trying to buy, this time, buy a supercomputer, the Cray from the from, from United States. And we, in our wisdom, said, we will sell it to you, but we are worried that you will use it for nuclear programs, and, and we don't want you to do that. So we're going to put a U.S. monitor in the, in the computer center to make oh. sure what the job loads are not nuclear. Hmm. That was too much for India to take. They said, no, we, no, we can't do that. And somebody who well, I knew called Mr. Petroda said, Paul, well, let's go and build our own machine. Mm-hmm. Can you do it? So I, was, I, I, started doing, I started to work on a parallel. And clearly, we couldn't do a Cray-like machine because we didn't have the... Wait, you, you started trying to build a supercomputer yourself? <clears throat> yeah, so the, uh, this, is a, this cool. is a national project. Okay. So I was put in charge. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And uh, as, a, as a side job to my main job, which is running this R&D group for this uh, big company, that company, by the way, had 20,000 employees, but R&D was about maybe 1,000 people, and I was running them, plus I had the central research lab, I had a research lab I started. So this is the second job I had, and, uh, but we, we knew we can't take on Cray uh, or take on IBM, we really, that, but there was a new idea coming up, those are called parallel computing, just buy, you know, the Sun chips from, from the United States, which was, no, you can buy them, and put them in parallel and build the software around them to make them they won't scale well in every job, but some jobs they do well. Mm. And, uh, and uh, there have been enough jobs where they may be useful, so let's build it. And sometimes, you know, so we always found this also, whenever India wanted to import some technology, usually they'll say, no, we can't give it to you. But we start building on our own, then they get, then they say, okay, maybe we'll mess sell it to you, because you'll build it anyway on your own, and we don't want to be left out of making some money. Yeah. So this is also a way of that threat. You know, we can do this on our own, and maybe then we'll, they'll come back to us. So this project also started, and uh, uh, and then you know uh, I was pretty well known in India, uh, for mainly for the Absosona, but I think in every, and I was you know <clears throat> Indian bureaucracy doesn't like people who are well known, so <laughs> so I was running into a lot of problems. So around ninety one or so, I wrote back to Stanford uh, when I sort of came up with the Esprit algorithm, uh, you know, long long eighty eighty five eighty five. Yeah. Uh, Stanford, Dr. Professor Kalat said, you know, you want to come back here, join the faculty, and you know, we will make it happen. Mm, nice. So, in 91, I thought back to saying, maybe I should come back and uh, at least spend a few years and get over, uh, you know, India is, uh, is proving to be uh, difficult with all these politics. Uh, people, you know, a lot of people shooting at you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and I couldn't take stress that well. So, he said, come along. So, we were going through, I think, a little bit of recession here, and I think a little difficult. But Sorry, I came back just, and uh, just a quick, quick re- rewind. Did, earlier, did you say that you knew Gandhi? No, like, oh, okay. Indira Gandhi. Indra, okay, so not act, the actual Gandhi. No. Okay, okay. She, she was uh, she was not not a relation of uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Okay, okay, yeah. Ma- <laughs> yeah but she was the daughter of Jawaharlal Nehru, our first prime minister. Oh, then you're, you're then she became oh, the prime minister herself. Oh, cool. Okay, okay. She okay. was very powerful. She was like the Maggie Mag- Mag- Thatcher of India. Yeah. And she was assassinated by her own bodyguard. A really tragic story. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. Okay. Um, so, uh, so I came back, and then of course you don't come to walk in as a professor at Stanford. You uh, came back and joined as a postdoc. Uh, postdoc. Uh, I used to be in a director of large lab in India, but you came, came down <laughs> as all, the, all the layers down, <laughs> down to the bottom layer, and uh, and then they started this process of getting me appointed. And so, uh, okay, so the professors to get you to come here, you had to. That, that was your entry point, and then once you're no, here, basically, you no. Basically, uh, no. I like a professor myself here. I want to hire a postdoc. I just do that. If I have the money, I can hire anybody. Oh, okay. I was hired like that. Yeah. Then of course, I think uh, uh, it, it reduces the bureaucracy of approvals and stuff. Yeah, no, not, not no, really. But I just was already sitting in the country, 
typically when we hire someone, we would, he's already got a job somewhere, he may remain there, we may interview him and all that. But finally, if he wins the, wins the normally it's a competitive bid, right? We'd go out with the requirement and people apply and then we go through the process of picking the, the best candidate. So instead of doing that while sitting in India, I was sitting here in the post office. Sorry, this uh, the post office. And, uh, and um, <clears throat> that's the time. So uh, the uh, so happened that uh, I needed to get me some salary. And there was a very well-known uh, math professor called Jean Gallup. I know you know the name, Jean Gallup. He was a very well-known person, um, wrote a lot of books. And he had a DAPA program on uh, interference cancellation problems, for example, problem he was looking at was an Air Force uh, reconnaissance aircraft uh, flying very high and trying to read what they call copy uh, signals uh, on the ground in order to figure out what's going on. <clears throat> These are mm. enemy enemy uh, uh, radios. And now, on the ground, uh, two radios are like 30 miles apart, and these radios are combat radios. They're only talking to a mile you know, from, the, from, the, from the platoon commander to the, some soldiers, to short-range radios. It turns out the propagation loss is very high on the ground. So a radio using a frequency F and frequency F can easily coexist without any problems. But at 70,000 feet, the propagation was very low. So both these radios will look in the same channel. You, know, you can't figure out what's going on. So people, you can use antenna arrays to sort of use signatures to separate them. So there was a long history of that problem. We call signal copy problem. There were hundreds of, not hundreds, but tens of PhDs and and some algorithms which were often used by the Air Force. I wasn't, it was secret, I didn't, I didn't have access to it. But we had a project here to saying that some of the algorithms were not stable mathematically, so can you use some better mathematical techniques to make it more stable? So Professor Golub had this, ex, uh, had this uh, project and uh, I was <clears throat> attached to him, saying, you know, why don't you earn my salary working with him? Uh, till I, my, my, my appointment process went through, and there was no guarantee that I would win the... Oh, you were a postdoc for Gene Gallup. Yeah, oh, so I was wow. sort of working mm-hmm. with him. Uh, I was actually in, sitting in, in, the, in the E department, but I was working with... Uh, nice. But at that time, uh, you know, we would do simulations of data using MATLAB, some tools. I always felt that, you know, we should have some real signals, not... not uh, you know, don't create the mathematical signals and then try and solve the problem. Let's have some real signals. And this so, was around um, 85? This is, this is, no, this is 91. 91. 91. Okay. I mean, I came in 91 October, so it's 92, around okay. 91, 92. So we had this prototype very quickly built and we were trying to get some real signals for a real inter- wanted signal and interference signal and you want, to, you want to separate the two or cancel the sky. Uh, so we were doing it, uh, we're picking, you know, doing this on a PC. So, so, and uh, the way it works is the signals are, you know, I'd used, uh, I just took cordless phones those days to act as signals. He so said, those guys are too close to each other, we, the, the system will break down because it can't see a difference in signatures. But the far apart, it will work. And, and that's how it behaved. But one day it rained in, uh, in, uh, it rained in, 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 uh, in, uh, in Stanford. So I moved that equipment uh, into the foyer of the building and for some reason, I noticed that when, this, when these two when these two cordless phones were next to each other, you know, or maybe two guys, just two students working, standing next to each other, I could still separate them. So that was unusual. That was startling. It should not happen because. Uh, yeah. So then it quickly occurred to me that the 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 multipath effects of bouncing on the walls was making it happen. And uh, so that was a kind of a new discovery for anybody in wireless that you can actually separate signals next to each other because of multipath. So, that's, but it wasn't relevant to the Air Force. Air Force problem had no multipath. This was aircraft flying at seventy thousand feet. There was no multipath there, so it's irrelevant to that problem. But just thinking about it, so I was having a haircut. I think three, four days later, then I said, "No, what happens if these two signals from two different radios come from the same radio and you put them on two antennas and you?" Maybe you can make a little bit of calculation show that you can actually double the capacity. You have four by four antennas. You need to have as many antennas as on that side as this side. So if you have two uh, two antennas there and two here, you get twice. You get four there, four here, four, four times. And a uh, little bit of there were the actual the real detailed proofs, uh, very esoteric, uh, rigid proofs. I didn't have. 
but uh, but but quick calculation, you know, back of hand calculation showed it all it does work. Did, and it was it was visible. The, did that insight, like in part, come from your background in the parallel processing? <clears throat> it like, came partly, I would say, from my Sona background. Oh. So Sona's uh, obviously had a good understanding of multi path. In Sona, we did beam forming. We were doing a lot of array processing in Sona's, a lot of array processing. So I had good intuition for those things, and uh, I think that helped. And uh, and uh, of course, I had worked a couple of years in direction of arrival estimation at Stanford and theoretical stuff, Esprit in 85, 85. I think all that helped. And uh, so, to, by having this haircut, I said, you know, we can actually, by uh, having multiple antennas at both ends and doing the right coding and encoding, you have to do some processing, you can actually make a, 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 a signal bandwidth like you have, let's say, a one megahertz bandwidth, you can make it look like two or four or five or eight without any penalty. Because mm. uh, you, you get it for free if you have these antennas, you use the right coding. And uh, so I had some calculations to show that worked. Uh, and uh, so then we wrote a patent. But at that time, everybody I talked to in the cellular world, we were still using AMPS forms. And this wasn't good fit for AMP, uh, analog technology. You needed and by the way, that, that was the MIMO key insight. That's, that is the MIMO. That was multiple the input, multiple output. Multiple yeah. inputs from antennas, multiple outputs at the side. And were you thinking like wireless internet at that time? Or no, I was thinking, thinking about increasing speed. Oh, okay. After that thing. Uh, I, no, when, the, when, when this idea came, I was not looking at wireless at all. I was looking at the Air Force problem. Oh, right. But then uh, the fact that you could do this triggered the idea of why don't you use communications. And then it, it, so that's how... Because more data can be transmitted. I can get more data, more throughput. Yeah. Plus there was no, no cell phones really back then. There were a few. Uh, there were only analog Sprinkle. phones. Yeah. And data was it's only voice. There was no data. So people went, I talked to some people, they said, you know, this is, this is too, too far off and yeah. we don't want multiple antennas phones, you know, not going to work. But we were just talking those days about television called digital HDTV was just coming on board. So we went, I went to Washington, uh, somebody here, I was still a postdoc, I think Professor Gallup, somebody paid for my ticket, I went there and talked to some people there and they said, this is real stuff, we want this kind of stuff. We're waiting for this is like worms coming out of woodwork. You know, with the, we have, they were trying to squeeze 28, 20 megabits into a small channel, and they were facing this problem of bandwidth. I said, this is a great idea, and uh, we should look at it. And uh, But the problem there was that, but anyway, there was a lot of support from that community. So we wrote, when I wrote Patton, I said, I pushed it towards that problem, but said you can use it for cell phones too. And... Um, um, but it turns out the HTTP community had progressed on it on their system too far around to make this to use this idea. So it's finally being used now in Europe in, in digital broadcast. But 20 years, 25 years ago, it was considered too early. They already started heading in a certain direction. That, that yeah, they, they, didn't, they didn't use this idea, so yeah. they have to change all the coding and all that. And it's too late. Mm. And um, so I came back, and then I found that there was no support for the idea. So I sort of. Uh, you yeah, know. I think I heard that you had a hard time getting it adopted by others. Yes, I could. I would talk about it. Uh, uh, in fact, I wrote I, I wrote a proposal to DARPA, <laughs> and DARPA uh, go through the first gate of DARPA. They said, "Let's look look at it more." I mean, we didn't reject it. Second gate, I remember meeting the DARPA officer. He said, I, he said, "I don't think it's going to work. It's too it's too good to be true." Uh, I like, give an example. Like they don't believe the math. Like uh, you show them the kind of the math. I did, I did, yeah, believe. but even you know, I should be able to convince them. But no, it was. Also, but uh, it didn't quite you know, exotic math to be convinced. But but here is the unbelievable part of it. You know, when you send digital data today, like in your phone screen, 4G, you're sending the, you send something called QAM. QAM is suppose I want to send in one in one signal instant, I want to send you six bits of data. The way I do it is. I have 64 dots of signal. I send you one of the 64 dots. So that's six bits of information. Today we've gone up to 1,000 cram. So one, once, once, one symbol I send you, I can send one of 1,024 dots, and I get, you get 10 bits of information. So let's say you go back 64 dots. And, you, and I'm able to get you know, six bits per, per symbol across the link. And let's say I put a 4x4 four four MIMO. I now actually can get, instead of 6 bits, I can get 24 bits across the link. It's 4 into 6 into 24 bits. So now we ask by the question... By having multiple antennas. By having multiple yeah. antennas. Now you go and ask, the saying, okay, you have this link sending 6 bits across, let's say I'm transmitting 1 water power, 
I'm getting some signal here, a lot of loss, but I'm getting, I need, I need to get about a factor of, almost a factor of 100 SNR, signal to noise ratio, in order to get six bits across. You can't get six bits with a lot of noise. You have to, wait. noise must be really low so that yeah, the bits don't get like blurred. Like Shannon's theorem. Shannon's capacity. And um, so, so let's say you have one watt coming across, you can get six bits. You put MIMO with four antennas, it's only one watt. At PG channel, it's only one fourth of a watt. You see, now you can get 24 bits. That is, one can show that. But uh, how much would you, how much power you require in, without MIMO to get 24 bits on this side? You got to go from six bits to, 20, to 24 bits. You'll require a million watts. This four antennas is equal to a million watts of advantage. When you say this, some people, they'll say something has to be wrong. You know, you can't just get that kind of stuff. That's what I think, I think, uh, you know, they, they, need a, they need a prototype, a proof of concept. Uh, you no, know, it, it's easy. I said, I because my demo of, of signal cancellation was analog. I wasn't doing digital, so I didn't have a demo of the digital value thing. But it's, anybody in the art could figure out this is true. But DAPA said, no, we don't think it's going to work. So, so that didn't work out. And um, and uh, I talked to a company, uh, the Qualcomm, they said, no, they don't think this is going to work, it can't be true, something is wrong. I spoke to some very well-known professor, uh, there's a big, the professor um, Tom Kova was a very big name Kover, in information yeah. theory. Yeah, yeah. Tom and also said, no, Tom, Paul, this is just too good to be true. Something, yeah. there has to be something <laughs> missing somewhere, you haven't thought it through. Yeah. But uh, but I have, so I have a demo of it, you know. But analog demo, which is good enough. But but nevertheless, I sort of said, you know, this is not this this is not going to be. Not, we can't build a company now to build something yet. Let's wait for some time. But, but you uh, believed it was a hundred percent right, and they were all wrong. So they were. Uh, you know, I, you know uh, for one thing, is this is that uh, 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 if you, if you pose the problem properly, mathematically, and then proof the capacity increases. Uh, I, uh, and I had posted it in a, in a very general way, and I couldn't find a proof. But, uh, but very quickly, you know, with, uh, with just some simple, simple thinking, you can, you can show it actually works. But a very rigorous proof I didn't have. Then it turns out only 1987, 1997, that is six years after my idea came, after my patent, that somebody in Bell Labs posed a simpler problem, slightly simpler problem, and then proved it properly. And I think that sort of opened up the thing. Then they said, no, this thing has got proper mathematical basis. But uh, anybody in art would have agreed with me that this actually, you know, works. But uh, then the list... And you showed it works on a small yeah. scale. Yeah. But. So, but after 87, I think uh, literature began to grow. So MIMO became a real thing. So in uh, 1997, so within a year, I said, okay, you know, uh, there was momentum building up in it. So I said, you know, I would then start, start doing experiments in Stanford to see, does it work in cellular environment? Can you put antennas on a cell station stuff, cell, cell, cell tower antennas? Put uh, those days, handsets were still considered too early for antennas. So we put a CPE, you know, like a you know, fixed modem with antennas and does it work and we have a lot of evidence from Stanford environment it actually works. So in 98 we started a company called Iospan and uh, and I built the first prototype of MIMO in the world and we, we, were, we, we were, I think we were Stanford had a website those days, I remember downloading Stanford website over MIMO link, <laughs> link. it does inside a room, it's inside a room. and. Um, and uh, so then, because the VCs uh, were trying to break the door open to get in and fund the company, <laughs> so we had some money. And uh, but, but so you, you really encountered obstacles early on. And what were some of the approaches you took to try to overcome those obstacles? That you, you held seminars. Kind yeah. Of, so what was it for? I we I began to run a workshop called Smart Antennas Workshop, and because uh, MIMO was a big part of it, but. Uh, the, using antennas and communications while it was was uh, was a new paradigm, you know, nobody had talked it. So I said I built a very big group. So we used to run a workshop, and it became the global workshop for this technology. And the people all over the world would come and say what they're thinking about. We, then I would run a course of saying this is all um, this is what we're doing at Stanford, and this is what this is the state of the art as I can see it. And uh, talked about I would talk about MIMO, talk about other things. And uh, so that was running for about 10, uh, it ran from 93 to maybe uh, almost 2000, I think. Then my company got back, I got busy in the company and we didn't really do the workshops anymore. 
So at that time, we were the kind of world headquarters for antenna, multiple antenna. It's called Smart Antenna those days. We called it. Smart Antenna headquarters was Stanford University. And uh, we became headquarters. And we can propagate ideas. And MIMO was the, the, the most important idea. There were other aspects of, of, of antennas. And um, uh, and so that that's how it went on. And uh, then I, I was fine when we uh, focused on a cellular type system and said, so what do you need to do? And so we married uh, MIMO with another modulation technique called OFDMA, so modulation uh, technique. It turned out those days CDMA was the dominant technique. You probably heard of CDMA. Was if, if, if not CDMA, forget about it. It was then. It was the. It was the Qualcomm was one of the kind of was successful company in that area. It's a, it had an old history behind it, but Qualcomm <coughs> pushed it forward. Like any startups, you know, ideas are cheap. It's making it happen was was always yeah. a tough thing. So they made CDMA successful, or trying to make it successful those days, and they didn't want to hear OFDMA in my mind, and that would have been a big problem for them. So I remember fighting with. Uh, you know, taking and talking to them and uh, getting a lot of pushback. And, and that's why, in part, you decided to found uh, IOSPAN to sort of commercialize the technology because the others wouldn't want to adopt it. I, I would say, you know, I was wanted to be an entrepreneur. And um, I said, you know, here is an opportunity to building a company and building a new technology. For example, a little earlier, but uh, in the early 90s, Qualcomm had grown. And they, they had taken CDMA, an older idea, but, you know, put some new things into it and made it into a successful company. So, uh, and it was considered to be 3G or 2.5G. So I said, 4G has to come and uh, if you want, and, it, uh, and I was also convinced that CDMA doesn't scale to high speed link, broad internet. When you want 10 megabits through or five megabits through, CDMA will not scale. It was very easy to show that. And I said, but my more FDMA, my more plus OFTM will do the right thing. I was convinced of it. So. To build a company to make you demonstrate that, that was the idea. Were, were there any other competitors sort of at the time, like someone from MIT doing some There was a company called Flareon, which was a competitor, which started, uh, came out of at and Labs, but they didn't use MIMO. But they did use OFTMA. They called Flash OFTM. So they did OFTMA, but MIMO was the really the, I think, the, the real secret sauce to broadband. OFTM was only, what, what I would say, it's also an older idea. It came back in the early 60s. It uh, avoided, uh, for a very broadband channel, CDMA fades, but MIMO would work well in broadband channels, like 10 megahertz, 20 megahertz, and all that. So OFTM, was the, so they used flash OFTM, but MIMO was, was, uh, so was ours, and we had no competition. So we built a, but you know, we built a system ground up from chips to boxes to base stations, the whole, the whole thing. And, uh, and we had one customer, but clearly, uh, it's clear that uh, going into to become a mobile mobile standard, you have to be, you have to standardize it in the standards process, and that was not beyond our ability. So to be successful getting IOSPAN off the ground, you you had to kind of build like the core infrastructure. Like no, we had to build all the boxes to deploy the system. So we had to have the base station, build the base station, build the base station antennas, the base station, and we had to build the we were not doing devices. Yeah, we had to be the client side, the CPEs. So all the electronics that today, uh, like ATT uses to deploy the system, we had to build it ourselves. You know, with even the network management system, everything had to be built, ground up. You had to raise a lot of money for that. We raised seventy billion dollars. How about that? Seventy, seventy million. Wow. And uh, so we are on one customer, and uh, and clearly running out of money. So um, we we had one or two very inter interesting offers, but uh, our board wanted uh, whatever off came. <laughs> Which was a very interesting offer. I said, you know, we want those days. You know, ninety one was a huge, the internet bubble, peak of the bubble. Ninety eight so, was like perfect time to raise money. Uh, ninety was the perfect money. Two thousand was the, the bubble was at the peak. Yeah. So, it's a good we time had, to we sell offers of eight hundred million. They said no. We want one point two five one point five billion. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, so this is unbelievable. So you know. Um, and I was always kind well, of that's when you sold to Intel, right? So Intel then bought the company, but for much less money. By the time Intel came in, the, 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 market, the, the, bubble, the bubble had burst. Oh. Bubble had burst. Oh. Bubble had burst. <laughs> and um, so, uh, so uh, it was not good news. But nevertheless, uh, Intel bought the company, and uh, so but they were convinced. I think, for, for, for fortunately, that this is the future of wireless internet. They wanted 
uh, wireless internet because uh, they felt that uh, wireless internet will propagate sale of uh, PCs, you know, laptop PCs. And so they needed connective wireless connectivity and then they can push their, their Pentium processors through. They were interested in selling Pentiums, they're not interested in wireless, but they could sell more if they had wireless link. It's a means to the end of selling more chips. So they backed this technology and they call this technology WiMAX. WiMAX. And I was an advisor to them. And, uh, and you know, Intel is a huge company and wireless is never fully part of the DNA. I was sort of struggling with to, to pull the team together. They had some good people. Oh, you had to work with Intel? I, mean, I became an advisor yeah, to them. Kind of I didn't want to be an employee with them, mm. but I was still at Stanford. Yeah. And, uh, but they, they picked up a lot of good people from the company. And so uh, then it, I sort of realized uh, somebody then, someone who was doing some chips in, uh, in, uh, for DSL came by saying, Paul, would be interested in doing a chip company for wireless. So then I was looking at uh, Intel, and so I said Intel was taking this, was making this into standard, making it global. I said, okay, let's go and build chips for that standard, WiMAX, because now it's uh, it's, it's happening. Intel is backing the idea. So we we formed a company called Beseem, and uh, that got uh, acquired by Broadcom later. Yeah, Broadcom later. So, uh, but to go back to my mom. Uh, it's now, it's so, it, the leverage is so huge. And now what's happening is we're now moving to millimetric wave where the, for example, let's go back to standard cellular today. In LTE today, the MIMO order is 4x4. Four four. Four, you can go up to 4x4 four four MIMO today. Why not 100x100? Why not hundred hundred? The problem is, uh, first of all, at the base station, these antennas are very big. If you put 100 antennas in the tower, there's no place for anything there. So... There's no real estate available for putting no antennas at the base station. And the handsets also don't, you cannot put too many antennas in the handset, right, because of a variety of issues. So so today, at the, at the frequency we operate today, 1.1 gigahertz, 2 gigahertz, 4 by 4 seems to be around the maximum. And even in, in Wi-Fi, you see the antennas taking out routers, 4 by 4 is typical. It's mm -hmm. going to go to 8 by 8 soon. But in millimetric wave, when antennas get really small, you can go to hundreds of antennas at the base station. So now MIMO becomes so much more powerful. Mm -hmm. So the huge leverage of MIMO, because now MIMO is now the core of all Wi-Fi, all 4G, LTE, but in 5G, in the future of Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi also go to, go to its own generations. So MIMO is getting so more and more. Antenna shrinking is sort of the key. Because to antennas typically are half lambda dimensions. Uh, I mean, uh, standard simple dipole, uh, what you call patch and the half lambda. And, and the, the lamp today, my 4G phone is working at 900 megahertz. Lambda is three feet. At 28 gigahertz or at 60 gigahertz, that's what the 5G will do. Lambda is just two millimeters. So, and I, I can, from that antenna, I can go to such a small antenna. So in this plane, I can put 10,000 antennas. I get a leverage of 10,000 speeds. And so no, it's so that really my most huge the now. Transmission. So it's already huge today in in, in 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 current systems, but even bigger in the future. How how do you see it progressing? Like let's say ten years out, twenty right. years out, what, what, what kind of speeds could we? Right, I would say that uh, um, the the one of the issues, of course, is when you go to higher speeds. Is also the ability to process because it turns out the the decoding of this of the you have to encode and decode. Encoding is usually simple, but the decoding can be really complicated to do. So uh, today, a two by two stream itself is challenging. Actually, a four by four, you you're, it's almost impossible to do it optimally. You got to sort of back off from optimality and do it without suboptimally. But uh, uh, but at a large number of antennas, in the, you know, the processing throughput becomes a challenge. So there, there's some limitations to how much you can scale it, not because of MIMO doesn't work, but you just don't have the power to do these things properly and so on and so forth. So the leverage will, I think the leverage will, will probably go to 100 at some point. How soon is hard to predict at this point in time. And there's a slight version of MIMO called multi-user MIMO. So there, instead of sending all the streams to one guy, you can generate 100 streams, but send them to 20 guys with five streams each. We can do that also. Yeah. There, what happens is, it is nice because the phone only needs to have five antennas, but there were 20 of them participating simultaneously. And uh, so, and then the processing per phone comes down. And 
So, so there are a lot of ideas called the, the multi-use of MIMO, distributed multi-use of MIMO, lots of, there's a lot of variation of MIMO now. So, uh, and, uh, and 5G has embraced all of them, the next generation embraced all of them, Wi-Fi has also embraced all of them. Um, and I think where it will finally pan out is still a little early for 5G to say, to say that because 5G is still about 2-3 years away. It will first come I think in fixed wireless, uh, they are trying to build gigabit pipes to homes. I think that's where MIMO will come in at 28 gigahertz and give you not a huge leverage, maybe a leverage of 4 initially. But it will it'll increase after that. And, and that can be used within the, like the fiber optic cables to the The idea form. is to bring fiber optics to about every 10 houses. Yeah. And then see, fiber optics, every house is too expensive. Because you, it takes about $4,000 to run the cable to your house, I believe. Because you've got to dig, out, dig up the street. Yeah. And then the guy says, I don't want the service. That's a lot of dead money. Yeah. So you don't want to do that. You want to bring it to a point like that, 15, 20 houses around you. And then Super if somebody brilliant. wants to sell him a modem, he doesn't want it, fine. At least 10 customers will pay for the cable. So it's a much better business model. Yeah. Google tried fiber. It hasn't worked out. Well, really? Google, yeah. Okay. yeah, I remember I have, they were trying to give it to the Stanford faculty. No, we have it. I have fiber. You're free. But this is free. So I, I don't want to pay for it. I'm, I'm happy with it. And Google's put the money in. But when have a commercial operation, it hasn't succeeded for them. It's too expensive. Because a lot of sunk cost. So, but I, so, you, so for wireless is beautiful because the, you only sell, I mean, the first of all, the modems are much cheaper to run now. Once you, you, you fiber you've got to dig in is expensive, but the last 200, 100 feet meters, it can be purely incremental. If somebody wants to buy a modem, he pays $50, buys a modem, he doesn't want it, that's fine. So, and it solves a lot of other problems, like uh, there's countries that don't have any cables running in the ground, right, right. so they just have cell signals. So it has to, in many ways, uh, wireless is really the way to go. Yeah. So it will come in as initially as fixed, but finally handsets will have it. So there's a huge, uh, you know, uh, today 5G, uh, uh, every day there's a huge conference somewhere in the world, (laughs) a lot going on. And uh, so it turns out MIMO, uh, and and then the uh, the pairing of MIMO and OFTMA was done in IOSPAN. I I didn't invent OFTMA, OFTMA was invented in Bell Labs in 1960s. The pairing was a critical pairing, and uh, I won't go into detail why, but that has now become everything, all current systems are OFTM, MIMO OFTM, all futures MIMO OFTM. So that became a rock. Uh, I can't see it being shaken now because it's so fundamental. So it was very it's fortunate. It's like integrated in the infrastructure and every, everybody's building off of it. The, it's so. a, uh, the, the, that combination, uh, so MIMO... Uh, it turns out there are other ways of doing uh, multiple access or modulation techniques, spread spectrum, CDMA works that way. MIMO doesn't work with them very well. It works well with OFTM. But MIMO is such a huge leverage that, and since OFTM works well with it, OFTM and MIMO got married together. And it was hard to separate that. So that's become the fundamental thing, and I, I can see it being there for forever. And... Um, uh, and there have been uh, many attempts to see whether they can find any better ideas than things like things come. So it'll be more and more a MIMO, MIMO order, more and more a bandwidth. And OFDM is going through some what they call as um, numerology. That means normally in, in Wi-Fi, we, we do OFDM with 56 tones and LT we do with 1,000 tones, but people will bring in more flexible toning and things like that. But basic ideas are the same. So So I was very fortunate to stumbled on this idea in 1991, uh, which came not by thinking about anything, but actually doing an experiment. <laughs> the experiment said something was funny there, and that triggered the whole thing. But I would still say... That, that you couldn't prove it sort of generalizably. No, but, I could easily but, prove but, it, saying but, that it works. The, uh, but uh, getting, uh, you know, getting a rigorous proof, that is, uh, that's a, yeah, that's, I didn't get that. And that needed mathematics that I didn't have. I didn't, no, my, my, I was, I'm a naval guy, never had any <laughs> formal mathematics. I, so whatever math, whatever what I've learned is all self-taught. So <clears throat> somehow uh, I didn't have the math uh, to prove it rigorously. But anybody who, who knew uh, wireless would, would agree with me that this does work. I, I can prove it in with the 99 percent accuracy. One person was missing. Yeah. Well, at that time, were you kind of like the crazy guy in the room pitching this idea, and nobody else believed you, or did you have other people that kind of backed you and supported? You know, I would. Mm-hmm. Like, like I'm not Cover, a great communicator, example, was, was but I didn't yeah. have, you know, Tom Cover was suspicious. Yeah. He just said, you know, because I told you this idea that with four antennas, you, you, you're you making one watt look like million watts. 
you can at least we have eight antennas a one watt looks like a billion watts true absolutely true that uh, you wanted the speed that eight antennas gave you you would do with one antenna which is the technology those days you needed a billion watts i mean it's ridiculous of course so when, when you see in that light people say there has to be something wrong how can you get that much leverage there must be something wrong here and uh, and uh, so I, there are a lot of people, for good reasons, said no. You know? it's, it's kind of like people are thinking linearly, but but you had this paradigm shift and it created an exponential. Right. right. <laughs> and, and so, so Darko so said no. It seems crazy. Uh, but there was a uh, there was a guy in, in National Science Foundation, John Cousins. I wrote me a beautiful letter for my 70th birthday, who believed in it. He gave me some money. So my first money came from NSF. And um, did you have to go to Washington and like pitch him in person? Uh, I uh, uh, yeah, I did go, but. Uh, it turned out the moment I landed in Stanford, you know, there was a seminar on future of wireless or something like that in Colorado, and uh, and somebody said, "Why didn't you go for it?" I went for that. There I met John Cousins, and I told him, I mean, he got to know my background. I built sonars, high-speed computers. He said, "You know, Paul, you've done everything, so you must be you're a guy that we should back you. You know, you're a guy worth backing, because always the problem always in a lot of research is that the people are sitting in two different tunnels, two stovepipes." Practical people and, and somebody who can bridge both is very valuable. So See, he saw that's, that. That's really interesting. So he backed to you because of you and not because of him believing in the concept. No, no, um, I did go to him when I went to meet the HDTV guys and pitching the idea to them. They were very receptive. I did go and meet him and I told him on the board how it works. He said, Paul, it's a great idea. Yeah. But later on, I sent a proposal. I think he had a conference to back me and he always backed me all the time. So he just retired. So I had some uh, thing. But uh, it's only, I remember when we got it working and Qualcomm came and saw it, then they said, yeah, this has to be true. I mean, I would tell that time they said, they found every reason why you know, they thought it may not be right. But today, and then of course Qualcomm now is a, they ask Qualcomm, they're not CDMA, they are, they are MIMO FDMA company today. They, they had to pivot ch- change the because of some technology changing. Yeah. So that was the story of MIMO and um, had wonderful students uh, and postdocs. Uh, now I'm retired. I'm not active there anymore. But I've been sort of playing the valley a little bit, and uh, uh, you know, I, I did uh, another small startup with doing building, um, matching uh, uh, machine learning with Wi-Fi. And the idea here was very large Wi-Fi networks, which I didn't realize. Such machine things. learning as in deep neural. Deep machine learning, learning as uh, neural what we. Uh, but here's the, the the problem we were trying to solve was this. This started three years ago. It had been bought, it was bought by HPE last year. Um, and uh, the idea there was, uh, uh, University of Washington has 18,000 APs. I didn't realize that. No. University of Utah, Ohio State has 15,000 APs. Hmm. And they have IT staff monitoring what's going on. And the question is, uh, a lot of things do know, you know, a lot of things go wrong. You know, people have uh, difficulties in uh, handing over or uh, slow service or uh, DHCP requests or uh, fail. So a variety of people see their connection problems, a variety of problems. And uh, uh, IT staff to figure out what's going on, is this something anomalous, should I do something about it, what should I do, it's getting more and more difficult because the networks are getting denser, there's more interference, uh, and so on and so forth. The question was, can we bring in machine learning to try and help it out? Looking for patterns in the network yeah, behavior. Right. Looking to, for or, anomalies. Yeah. And it turns out that's not easy to do it, because... What is the anomal- what is uh, anomalous, uh, say, in a dorm may not be anomalous in a classroom because they're very different environments. For- so we have to learn what is anomalous and then flag and then try and help root cause it. And we might have seen that this anomaly has, uh, in higher state was root cause might have been nothing more than some software bug in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Apple release, perhaps sometimes. And you have a set of training data that's human curated. Yeah, and, yeah, not so much. We never, we, the most paradigm we've used are not been based on, uh, what do you call, um, uh, supervised learning, mostly unsupervised, oh, used okay. unsupervised Sub- support vector machines and, uh, and, uh, K means clustering algorithms, looking always for outliers. This, is the, this should be the pattern now, but there's some outlier that doesn't look okay. Maybe it's okay, but we go and dig into it and we find something is, is a problem. Then we flag it and it's presented with IT staff saying, we think there's an issue here. And maybe we think this may be the root problem that you're looking at. It creates kind of a recommendation engine to That's prioritize right. the different right, issues. Right. That to make the at. job of IT staff easier. And, uh, and to, you know, to augment their capabilities. Yeah, it's right. really, it's augmented. It's not, it's not a replacement human, augmenting 
and uh, very good feedback. And in fact, uh, uh, HP Aruba, HP by the water company called Aruba, which is a big mm -hmm. Wi-Fi company. Yeah, David Sheridan's company. Or was it David? David, I don't know. Aruba was started by Andy uh, by by uh, I think a guy called Kirti Malhoti, who's now running it. Oh, okay. Malhoti, nice guy. So, if I'm an advisor to them, to him, oh. I've tried to really join, follow the company after they acquired it, and advise to him, and. Um, and uh, so they bought the company and it's been a very successful, we call it Deep View. So uh, I'm sort of now shifting my thinking about uh, MIMO, there are tens of thousands of people doing MIMO and it's too mathematical now for me. So I'm really <laughs> uh, it, it's grown beyond your yeah. Yeah. Well, it's really huge. I also wrote the first textbook on it, but now there are many books. And a lot of my students are very active. You know, a lot of my students now are some of them professors and very, or industry, very active. They are, in fact, uh, yeah. The first leadership tier MIMO in the world came, a lot of them came from my group. Yeah, yeah. Vint, Vint Cerf told me something similar. He said when I when I invented TCP IP, like sort of creating the internet, it, it looked very different than internet now. Everyone's been building off of it. Not been, yes. It's yeah. gone, it's gone. You know, <laughs> I, I to say to my example, in 92, when I had this idea, uh, if, if you've told me that we will, MIMO and Broadband internet will be here. What it is today, and MIMO will be such an important part of it. I would say you're crazy. I never thought it so. <laughs> <laughs> Even you. <laughs> yeah, I would say so because you know it's just gone beyond anybody's. Uh, you know, in fact, it's so pervasive now. Smartphones and all that. So, yeah. So, so I've been moving. Uh, look, I started the AI lab in India. Remember way back. So I have some DNA in it. So I'm some sort of looking at that intersection now. So I, I gave a keynote two weeks ago. Those days of like expert systems. Um, yeah. Those totally days of uh, expert systems was a big thing, but it's not. It's not a paradigm people are using now. Yeah. yeah. So it's mostly now supervised and supervised learning, and I sort of believe that there are opportunities to improving wireless systems in different ways by bringing in these ideas. So I've been sort of pushing that now. So that's become my intellectual pressure point at this point. Wow. So you, you've kind of like shifted your focus to this advocacy uh, type yeah. role in, of, of, uh, and approaching this. Right. This because uh, first of all, I, I could see, for example, in this other company, Rasa, that's like my third company, uh, we could we could see we added real value by bringing in machine learning into, not into the core of the technology, but in the management of, of the system, the network management side. But I think it can also play a role in the core. So I actually gave a keynote saying, here are some crazy idea. They may be crazy, but some of them will be true. Let's think about it. Let's get the youngsters looking at it and so on. So, so I've sort of become, uh, but my mode self, I'm, you know, I'm not, uh, I, I, I get a lot of requests to do keynotes. I stopped doing it because I think I'm way behind. Everybody else is ahead of me. <laughs> yeah, it'll look bad if, you, if you're not abreast of the yeah, right. frontier when you're in the <laughs> Right now, you know, it's mostly, um, but you know, I would say that uh, uh, I, had, I spent almost 25 years in India. And uh, in almost 25 years in the US, so I have 50. But India was always building stuff, and uh, it's sonar, then it became high speed computers. Uh, I did a little bit of small other stuff like radars in this company, in this uh, company I was. And, and Stanford has always been wireless, um, so, uh, because uh, MIMO came in within a few months of coming to Stanford. So it's, it, it built my future for me here. And uh, and I'm pretty involved with China and with India. And in India, my big thing, I'm, I'm very involved in India. You know, you guys may not realize this. We have an idea of India being a very high-tech country. We import everything. Everything is imported. We have a lot of service mm -hmm. companies. We do a lot of services now. Intel has 10,000 people there. Uh, and HP has 5,000 people there. But we're all, but there's no much innovation there. Innovation is all here or in, elsewhere. So I'm trying to see whether we can build our own companies there, which can, you know, be a be an innovator, and we have good people there. It's just that the mindset is not there. And you're doing that by working mm -hmm. closely with universities like IIT. I've, yeah. and, I've been yeah. working with the government a lot, but I find government is hard to move. So right now, in fact, I'm very active now in, in next generation of wireless called 5G. So I want for the, all the young professors to build prototypes for 5G, build some, get some hands wet, build stuff, like I always did. And you know, and I said that something will good out of coming along. Maybe they'll start their own companies and things like that. So I've been pushing that, and uh, I've not been able to get funding. I went twice to India. You know, we're hoping there's a meeting day after tomorrow in Delhi, which uh, uh, I'm not going back for, but I believe we'll get the funding for it. And I'm lobbying the Indian government to fund it. So, so I've got, I'm in India. I'm involved with that, and I'm also a professor in China, a national professor, and 
there, uh, uh, they're sort of interested in my vision of what 5G is going to be. So I go there and spend some time with them. What are the key leverage points on sort of making that change? Because you're, you're kind of over here living sort of a privileged life here in Silicon Valley, but yet you want to help people over in there in India. Are, are you trying to approach it by like focusing on the government or, or the education system or industry? Or, yeah, or I think right now mostly with the, with the top schools, the IITs. Uh, yeah, the technologists. Uh, yeah. the, but the uh, government, I, I was... Uh, I initially tried, I'm actually a global advisor to Indian government on telecom. Uh, it doesn't mean very much, but I did try to see whether we could, uh, I always felt that uh, in India there's a lot of knowledge of wireless because uh, Intel, my own companies, all, these, all my companies have backends in India and we have some very, very good people there. In fact, I would say the chips that we built here were largely done in India. You know, we had mm. some supervisors here, but a lot of very good youngsters there. So. So they so, can do it. They can do they, it. They, they can absolutely been do it. it. Like, so, so I was trying to get the Indian government to find uh, find how to create more venture capital in India to help these guys build companies. But the Indian government, I think, has not been able to take that leap. Well, do you think you could have invented MIMO from India? Or you'd have to be here in Silicon Valley? To I would say, I mean, if I had the idea there, but for it to... To, for it to have the Impact. traction it's had, yeah, it has to be here. Yeah. Partly you being it, like, at Stanford reason. helped it. I know, being, you have an automatic, you know, credibility factor <laughs> as part of it. Then, you know, and I'm also, I would be, I'm also, I'm prepared to bet it'll be no way near where it is today if not, I not started IOS spec. And sure, it actually works. You had handsets, not handsets. You needed that seventy million in venture capital. Yeah, to and we showed it worked. It, we had a we had a full setup of three base yeah. stations in the in in Santa Clara, and uh, I, I still remember you know company coming looking at it and saying it actually works, and that then that that took it into standards and then Intel. So, so I think that kind of leverage India would never have had. So it would have, it would have, I mean, not to say it not have taken off, but. It was, it, it, uh, here I became the kind of evangelist for it, where somebody else would have had to be an evangelist. So India didn't have the capital or the mindset to be able to push these ideas. Even today, we have virtually no, we are, today we look at all the standards work done in Wi-Fi and cellular around the world, India doesn't participate. We just, uh, we are a no-show. So clearly, it was, you had to be, I mean, even Europe would have been difficult. I think you had to, Stanford mm -hmm. Silicon Valley was the right place to to get to my mode to come up with <laughs> to be born in a perfect place. In, in were you thinking that before you came here? Like, no, no. I got to be a son. I just had be because I had this kind of offer. You know, it was not a you know kind of offer saying you know because Esprit was very big. You know, it, it, it was when Esprit came out. It was a, it was a, it was a, and I think it dominated uh, research publications for for, for years. So, so people said, Stanford, no, if you can do Esprit, why don't you come back and maybe do something here? So I had that offer, and then I was having my own uh, frustrations in India. Uh, so I said, you know, for, uh, children were getting to high school. I said, maybe they can come and get to high school and get to college here. Yeah. So it was really, I was really a kind of an economic immigrant, but, uh, but, uh, but if I'd got it from a second-class university in the U.S., I wouldn't have come. I was already very senior in India, you know. I was, uh, and, and he came very, here as a postdoc. <laughs> yeah, he came there at the bottom of the uh, bottom. So, but uh, but because of Stanford and I sort of knew I knew people here and I knew that it will work out. So that's why I came. Yeah. Did you have any issues like they always talk about people, really smart people from India coming to America having visa problems? But did the professors work work that out for you to come here? No, those days there was no issue at all. You just uh, I, you know getting an um, H one B or green card was so simple. There was no problems at all. There was no, never a problem, and um, and uh, and of course because my leaving India was of course uh, was heavily noticed in the in the in the, in the papers because the people oh. I was very well known, <laughs> and uh, even today even today you find a lot of blogs talk about me leaving India and. Uh, Did they feel like you were kind of abandoning them? Uh, I you know not that but there's always a lot of uh, hard uh, soul searching saying why did Paul leave <laughs> and and uh, but I left for very good reasons you know the problem was I, I, my problem was I was uh, successful very early in my life you know by, by age 35 I was so well known in the country uh, I had the most successful project and it, it was not a it was like everything else was here and mine was somewhere there and it was so successful yeah. that uh, I, I attracted a lot of arrows. So, <laughs> and so it became almost you know, untenable to be hanging around. Yeah, actually, how do they sh sort of shoot at you when you kind of 
Stick your well, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't go into it, but uh, it was not. Um, do, do they do they like kind of try to smear you in the newspaper or like? No, 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 no. It, it is that you know. I think uh, uh, I think the my problem was I was trying I was trying to frankly acquire power to, in the in the in the LCA program. You know the the combat jet program. Uh-huh. I wanted to take it out of the government. Uh, you know. Uh, so that was all the post. Uh, I, I think largely because they didn't want to, you know, give me that kind of freedom because I've done pretty well with well, no normal no freedom. So, so <laughs> I. But nevertheless, I would just say that uh, you know, I'm a U.S. citizen. I'm certainly loyal and thankful to this country, but also love India. And India is a great country. We have many many good things for us, and we have a lot of poor people still. We have 300 million really poor people. So. So I really see it my duty to help help India. Did you have any mentors uh, here at Stanford that helped you be yeah, successful? Yeah, so Professor Tom Kaila, who was actually my examiner for my PhD thesis. Later on, he was my host for my visit here when I came here. And uh, then later on, when I came back as a postdoc, I mean, he was the first guy who said, I'll give you an appointment, I'll give you a job here. Uh, so he's always been a mentor. He's still... Uh, He's not retired you know, way before me, but uh, still very much. Uh, he used to live nearby here, but he's moved into, into Atherton. Wow, that's I mean, awesome. And I also had a mentor in India, uh, another my PhD professor in India. At IIT, and, New Delhi. At IIT. And, uh, you know, i known people in the government, and uh, I'm still very connected. I have, I have lots of friends in India. So and your interest. family, I'm sure. Right? I have family, too. Yeah. Uh, my, my daughters are here, but uh, my sister is there. And if I, I sometimes go back to India 10 times a year. Nowadays I go back three or four times. I'm going to be there next 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 month. But I go back pretty often. Well, imagine that you had a, a Stanford a PhD graduate in the room, and he was about to embark on founding a software company. Uh, what advice would you give to him or her uh, in terms of how to be more successful as a software right. entrepreneur? Yeah, I I wouldn't particularly put my remarks towards software, but again, I would say a few things. One I think is important: the persistence. I think. Uh, in all my companies, nothing ever goes as you want it to go. You go through very rough, rough times, ups and downs, and uh, you don't want to, you know, don't lose heart. Uh, so it's uh, so. I think uh, persistence, I think, is the most important quality in, in as an entrepreneur. And I think um, I generally have. Uh, I'm probably getting less persistent at old, but I've been persistent when I was younger. Uh, that's one. And second thing I think is. Uh, it's very important to pick the the the, for the core three or four people. You the, the core of the company. You got to be very careful in picking them. Make sure they are really good, really good people. Uh, certainly bright, but also somebody that you can you know you can you'll have a difference of opinion with them, but but somebody you can get on. You have some level of mutual respect that uh, that that will overcome paper over things that will bad days that's going to come. So mutual respect and uh, and but very bright people. Uh, I think if you have that and then you have persistence, I think uh, that there's so much opportunities today. I think you're going to be successful. You'll find something. It's really, if I always say bet on the team, forget about the idea. Ideas, if not the first idea, second one will take off. Bet on the team. And, uh, and what, what were some of the the key people you pulled in early on on IOSPAN? Yeah. I, all the, all the, these companies always had uh, students st- former students. Mm. Uh, 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 in the core was always former students, but you know I always realized that in Iospan we were building heavy iron boxes, heavy iron uh, chips. Uh, these students from uh, PhD from Stanford, even though he's written a lot of papers, he doesn't know anything about building anything. So uh, very quickly you bring those to bring the sparks in and the and the thinking power, but you have to bring in some grey hairs who know you know were experience of, of building things. So, so you know, the core team is always my former students or somebody I knew. But uh, very quickly, I would bring in uh, more seasoned people uh, would uh, would be the, uh, the build a company. Yeah. Also, the, uh, but I, I tend to use former students as uh, as, uh, as the initial core because I know them. You know, there's a relationship, so we can. Figure out the company, and then once the, the things are setting well, then you can bring other people in. And, and you've worked with them yeah. for years, so you, you really know them. We know them well. Yeah, the technology, yeah. Yeah. knowledge, and skill. Yeah. And then you know, certainly the intellectual thing. You also know them. Usually, you know them well in terms of personal skills and, tr- and trust. And, it's, uh, yeah. and the real thing is not knowing them well on a good day; is knowing them well on a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I'm curious about uh, some of your morning routines. Like when you wake up in the morning, what is your first 60 minutes in the day look like? I like <laughs> a cup of coffee, I think. But I'm not, right now I'm involved in advisory roles with a number of companies, okay. including Facebook and HP because they bought my company. I'm involved with another carrier, Vivint. That's right. Facebook actually has those. Um, Connectivity lab. Yeah, they they have like they're doing some crazy projects where they're yeah. like flying um, they like solar a, they power have a drone. They have drones. drones probably they have satellite systems and yeah. so I'm advisor to, to propagate them. internet. Yeah, or, uh, in like other countries, they want to get, they want to propagate uh, internet access all over the world. So they're all a very interesting project. They're I think it's a lot of money they're doing that. They're sort of diversifying a lot. Actually, how do you feel about that compared to Google's like Project Loon approach, where they had these yeah. balloons? Yeah, so Loon was one way of doing it. The, uh, the a corresponding way Facebook took us was a drone concept. This is a solar-powered thing will fly for two months. All of them have the positives and negatives uh, around them. Um, I think both of them are persisting with that idea, and uh, they're clearly not yet operational. And uh, and uh, uh, but uh, but but Google has gone through some compression. They've decided that uh, there are lots of projects going on and they're compressed back to one or two because they said they don't think they should be in business of building stuff and becoming a, you know, here you're really playing the role of a vendor. You're becoming an Ericsson or, or, or Qual, not Qual, you know, Qualcomm, you're building boxes so like Ericsson or Cisco. Uh, I don't think, I think Google discovered maybe they don't want to do that. And uh, I think Facebook is still sort of persisting but uh, they too have to figure out because their DNA is software, uh, how do they sort of get into these things? Because these are very heavy engineering systems and yeah. it's a very different DNA. I'm deeply involved with them to try and help them and make them successful. So I'm involved with many startups too. So I'm busy with these sort of things. And I go to India very often and uh, I quickly go to China and go to Europe. So, so I'm having fun. What do you think is the highest impact technology that will help sort of spread the internet to another 2 billion people? Right. Uh, would, it, would it be... Uh, no satellite in the sky or something. Or, yeah. yeah. So the the satellite will, can play a role, but the problem with satellite is is that uh, if it's a very simple satellite, it act like one base station. One base station satellite covers hundreds of square miles. You know, or the footprint of an antenna. Uh, one base station doesn't give enough capacity because there are satellites now with hundreds of antennas which can form spot beams and it can act like hundred base stations. But I think satellite is this, has to act like a, a thousands of base stations before it can compete with terrestrial network. Here we can put up a, we can put up base station every 200 meters. Every base station member has certain capacity, so you replicate capacity again and again. So satellites have, are more thin route, they're not, they're not dense uh, systems. They're good for countryside, you know, going fishing and all that. Mm. So, but nevertheless, uh, the, the technology improves, they can be competitive. So satellites, then drones or balloons or loons, and then terrestrial systems. Uh, uh, so, uh, and uh, each one has a different play depending on geography and and uh, and, uh, and other infrastructure around. But nevertheless, uh, uh, I think uh, phones are now penetration of phones. Voice phones is 98, 99%. Everybody has in the world. But broadband is still low. I think uh, a really good broadband, like 10 megabit link, I think uh, less than, I would say less than 10% of the people world population have it. And about 50% of the world population has no access to data, internet at all. So they, we, we've got to connect them. And I must say that uh, Facebook and Google are trying very hard uh, to do something about it. Uh, and, uh, and I think also there's good business models within these countries to do it also. So, uh, but uh, the, the value of the internet, I think, is huge uh, as a multiplier for, for, for growing a country and you know, advancing the GDP. So, that's a big challenge for everybody, and that is going to happen. Facebook and Google have a similar motivation as as Intel in a way, where uh, they 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 want to sell more. Intel wanted to sell more chips, okay. and so it's like an instant. Uh, Facebook wants to get more eyeballs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they are all driven not so by by the core technology as much yeah. as by other things. Yeah. But nevertheless, I think it's, it's, yeah, it's still a win. It's still a win if you can get yeah. internet. Yeah. You don't have it. So I think that's the getting. Uh, I'm even Vince for degree or Bob Khan. Getting a good internet access to the world's population will be a huge uh, multiplier in every way. It will improve, uh, you know, economic factors very strongly and health factors, everything. And it's not that today. Even India, I would suspect, uh, eighty percent of India doesn't have really any any kind of real internet. So very poor. 
Yeah, it's it's kind of strange for me to think of it that way because I think of India and I think of advanced technology like yeah. the IIT people I met here at Stanford. <laughs> but it's, yeah, you know, it's, it's exactly like the, the, the real truth is it's very different. And a few pockets like Hyderabad and Bangalore and Delhi, you see it looks like it's in this country, super, yeah. but you go away 50 miles, uh, it's back to Bulacats and. Um, but everybody has a phone. Phone is really spread. <laughs> Using uh, Mimo. <laughs> For, yeah, yeah. Almost. So, but they have a smartphone here. Yeah. <laughs> but in the India, people with Mimo smartphones, smartphones have become very cheap. They can't afford a data plan on the on the cellular. It's too expensive. It's expensive here. So they use rely on Wi-Fi. So we need mm. to bring Wi-Fi into India. That's way then they connect on Wi-Fi into a smartphone. So Wi-Fi is way wi broadband is spread in India. That would be the first entry point to have yeah, the biggest impact. Right. Because cellular, first of all, more people travel in cars. Uh, the people go in buses, of course, and getting getting access to internet on a bus also is an interesting uh, technology we need to do. Here we do we them, we bring them LTE to the bus and then jump on Wi-Fi. But in India, that will be expensive. So, but Wi-Fi will be the way, finally, the last 10 feet will be a Wi-Fi in India. That's the way to do it. What is the the worst advice you've ever seen or, or heard being dispensed in, in, in your world, uh, whether it be entrepreneurship or technology? Probably the worst advice is, uh, this is too hard, why don't you give up? <laughs> yeah. I sort of seen that. That your persistence. Yeah. What advice would you give to your yourself as a 20-year-old man or yeah. a 30? Probably to live a more balanced life. I've been... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> too much involved in my job and and uh, and um, technology, and um, I should have paid more attention to things outside those areas. I think I've been and by balance. You mean like more time with the family, family, yeah, and, and more holidays and holiday, exploring the world yeah. for fun, enjoyment. Yeah, that's really good advice. And the reason for that is it's more life enjoyment, or it's like actually better for creative process or productivity, uh -huh. like in the end. Or yeah, I think it's it's, it's more meaningful. It's, it's also. You know, in part for people around you, that you are oh, yeah, not so yeah. focused on things. Yeah. But also, I do. I can't comment about the creative process. But uh, if you're overworked <laughs> and uh, sleep deprived, you're not functioning properly. So, uh, to be rested and uh, make the big decisions, you want to make sure you make them when you're, you know, when you're when you're fully there. But I, I never really worked all that hard in the United States. In India, I used to work much harder. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I had much bigger. I was dealing with much bigger projects. Uh, startup companies are still small compared to what has been in India. Yeah, I think there's like a billion people in India. Did, did yeah, you one feel point one billion. Now. Did you feel a sense of like intense competition pressure because you've got these billion people you're competing against? Not really. <laughs> or, <laughs> not really. You know, like I was, I was sort of, I, I sort of stood above the curve very quickly in my life, right, right in the beginning. So. I never had any comp. Probably was my, my my problem was not enough competition. <laughs> no, I didn't have that problem. And and you know, we talk about mentors. I've had lots of good mentors in India also. And uh, I, I had to, you know, for all of us, you know, we are where we are because others have helped us. So absolutely. And I'm kind of curious, what have you changed your mind about in the last few years? Yes. Like something you believe that was true, but you've shifted your thinking about. Um, I would I would say uh, shift my thinking about startups. Mm -hmm. I always thought they were easy to do because if you had uh, an idea and and, uh, and and you know it was doable and you can build it, uh, you would uh, uh, people would come and buy it. It turned out that that's not necessarily true. Uh, you got to convince people and uh, and uh, so the idea of you know to create a market for it because. The best of ideas is uh, if there's no sense to it, you can't sell it. So you have to create a market for it. You have to evangelize it. Uh, so I didn't realize that uh, that because in India the other, it's the other way around. Because everybody we were importing, let's say sonar or radar, you can build it instead of that. You, know, you have an immediate customer, and they would beg you to do mm. it. Here you have an idea and you can build the stuff, but nobody ready, ready to buy it from you. So you got to, and particularly in in, in the wireless world, it's a huge ecosystem. And that system doesn't move easily, you know. So you have to convince many people, many layers, to bring a technology in. So it's more hard, much harder that way. And what's the best approach on convincing people? Like showing them kind of I a think, map I think, or I think showing, showing them, them is useful. System? Showing them is useful, and uh, of course. But also, I got a feeling that a lot of people have blinkers and mindsets. So 
Yeah. So, so I think you got to, the truth is right in front of them. They can't see yeah. it. Like for example, I think MIMO, to some extent, uh, MIMO FDMA and what today 4G technology, we have to give credit to Sean Maloney at Intel. Mm-hmm. He's the guy who bought IOSPAN. I mean, he could see in his mind's eye that this is the way to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I don't think anybody else, any major company, which also looked at acquiring us, really believed that way. So one of the approaches is like finding those visionary well, types. Look for many people, and, and then, one of them and hopefully will connect. will see it and connect and connect, and then you know then everything is different after that. But it's uh, you may have the best mouse trap, but you can find that the, the people who should do, should say yes will say no, uh, because I think decisions are not necessarily rational. A lot of things, and sometimes it's not rational in a way because it may upset their own business plans or whatever it is. So it's very different. Uh, yeah, that, that's one of my observations. Like part of the reason why you've been successful is not only that you're kind of smart in technology innovation, but but also how to navigate the human landscape. landscape. Like like in the India India military, how you were able to figure out, oh, we need an air force guy to help right, get, right. Get the, push this forward and make it appear like kind of an internally generated project. project. And then uh, being able to connect with the Intel. Uh, okay. right. um, that, is a, that is a critical part of how it uh, worked out and, for me. Yeah. And it's just kind of street smarts in a way. And, uh-huh. and, uh, yeah. Uh, Hopefully, I don't know. But, yeah. uh, but certainly, you know, we think that it, uh, uh, particularly in, in just wireless, this is a global ecosystem. Uh, it's uh, one person or one company can't move it anymore. It's, uh, you need to find partners and uh, you need to keep knocking on the doors all the time. So, Do you see any kind of like bad things or like threats or risks or like sort of negative consequences of, of some of your inventions like my you know, I, um, you know or is it just all 100% good like I think more, at, at the technology more, you know, uh, I think it's uh, I can't see anything bad about it but but certainly internet uh, is, is, is is certainly a wonderful tool but it also has downsides so we can just clear to see yeah, like and cyber, cyber attacks and like all sort of things you know. so I think it's a uh, yeah. And you know, I think the world today is, to me, it looks much more unstable and much more uh, unstable. dangerous. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we have you know, huge problems in the world. I mean, look at what the Middle East is in a bad shape. Uh, North Korea, North Korea, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah, Russia. Yeah, well, you know, most countries are in turmoil. I mean, look at uh, Brexit and what's happening here. Syria. And yeah. partly, I got a feeling that some of it is due to internet and the way mm. fake news or whatever. But. Mm, yeah, People are much less happy with 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 what they have, and uh, <laughs> yeah. whatever whatever the reason is, I think it's a it's destabilizing. It is something is destabilized. It's clear that the world is much un- mm. more unsafe, and maybe the internet I mean, has been part of it. Has been a part. Of it. Yeah, like, like for example, the Arab Spring, right? The, Arab Spring, the yeah. Twitter helped people kind of. I think even Syria would not have blown up without internet. Syria. It started out with one boy being killed, and but internet spread that, and anger came, and then finally, the whole thing is a huge disaster. So, uh, it's it's wrong to say that no, that uh, that uh, ignorance is a good thing, but sometimes, uh, without proper control, it creates problems. I, I heard Alan Kay speak a little bit about this, and he said, you know, some of these information technologies we've been inventing, it it's it's we're putting them in the power of. Uh, all, like so many billions of people, mm-hmm. and and it's almost like giving a caveman nuclear weapons. <laughs> so, uh, probably bad actors who can. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but on the other hand, it's uh, produced you know, a transform our lives, made it so much more convenient, and uh, and of course still transforms society. And I think uh, as somebody is pointing out, uh, I think Warren Buffett, you know, uh, hundred years ago, eighty percent of this country. Uh, was required to feed the country. Now 3% feeds it and we export a lot of food. But uh, 80% of jobs today have also been going to disappear. Oh yeah, like self-driving cars and truck drivers. All sorts of things. Okay. Automation in the offices and and uh, it shrink down to 2-3% and we had to find new jobs, uh, new things to do. There's, still, there's no clarity what's going to happen and we can't see it happening. And um, so uh, and if we don't solve that problem, we'll have much more unrest and the people, and inequality, all sort of things will come. So, <clears throat> so all these things are double-edged weapons. Uh, but that doesn't doesn't mean we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't develop these things. But I think we certainly need more uh, more uh, human factor skills in, in in our society to deal with them. 
purely, you know, just unleashing technology without thinking through the societal issues is is, is a problem. And I'm curious, what uh, or how has failure or apparent failure set you up for later success? Yeah, I think you know, yeah, I've certainly learned. I mean, I'm, none, none of these has been uh, uniform successful. There've been failures too. I would go back and say that uh, uh, carrying people with you, the, being, making extra efforts to carry people with you, and uh, and persistence. I think I would put them as two important things. That uh, were there times where you didn't have persistence when you uh, showed up. I would I would say that you know yeah. I I think I've been I'm I'm pretty persistent, but uh, whenever you have, you have I, your limits when yeah, you I go over to yeah. <laughs> like for example, I coming to living in India and coming here was a lack of persistence. I should have probably stayed on there. And persisted and um, done different things there. Uh, so, I, I, and that is uh, that is well known in India that I sort of quit. And uh, I think that was a failure certainly. And and uh, and also carrying people with you is important to carry people. Sometimes um, you know you're right, uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, you can you know ramrod it wrong. In fact, when I was doing my first startup, I would say this is much slower than in India. In India. You were the boss. Uh, uh, you say this has to be done, and they would do it for you. And they don't question here. Like sort of hierarchical hierarchical yeah. orders, and yeah. uh, and everything worked very well there. But here, people want you. To, they will doubt it, and they will question you. Things slow down here. <laughs> so, but the thing in India is that the boss, you know, disappears or monkey takes over. Everything collapses. But mm-hmm. here, you have much more uh, depth of. Thinking so that even though the top guy disappears, you know, the system can take over. It's much more democratic here, so, but it's slower. It's slower. So I always, in fact, as I say, I used to quote Truman when he came to White House. He used to say, uh, "I thought coming to being president says do this, do that, everything happens. Says, Nothing happens in Washington." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think President Hennessy said that too about becoming president of, of Stanford. He like in the beginning he thought that uh, he, he would sort of set the vision and then rally, rally the troops in a way to go in a direction. But, but instead, it, he, he realized his role was more just like uh, figuring out what the community wants to do right. and like help make that happen. <laughs> yeah, he had a, I think we were trying to do a campus in New York and uh, you know that thing. That, yeah, uh, green tea. Put yeah. A lot of, he put a lot of mental energy into it and finally it didn't pan out. That's interesting. So you, you viewed a little bit leaving India and running into that challenge and in a way quitting as almost a failure and to, when you came over here. But in fact, it ended up being, it, it enabled you for this huge success because you said you couldn't have pulled this off. Right. Mimo and yeah. So I think, you know, uh, yeah, I would never predicted that I would, no, I would be lucky to have this idea. And um, yeah, true. But uh, purely for Indian context, or Indian context, uh, yeah, of course, a lot of Mimo has created jobs in India because a lot of chip designers all over the place. But still, I think, uh, India would have probably benefited if I had stayed on and you know led other things. And uh, we, we, we still, I keep saying, we're still importing technology. Maybe if I stayed on, I would have, I could have changed the scenario. It was like a brain drain in a way. By yeah, way. yeah, they call it, they call it that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but, I, but I also justified myself. So I, I delivered two huge systems to India. You know, the, <laughs> two and a half. The one small sonar, the big sonar, then the large computer, which was always success, successful. So, so I, I tell myself I've done my job for the country. Let me do something else. <laughs> but nevertheless, when, I, when you came over here, did you leave your parents behind in India? My parents had already passed away. Oh, they did. Oh, okay. And I'm enormously yeah, grateful for the United States for all the opportunities we had here. And uh, so it's a uh, you know, and I, I still haven't lost my connection to India. So I've had the best of both worlds. I'm kind of curious. What is uh, one of the best investments uh, that that you feel like you've made? Not Maybe in money or, or time or energy. I would say you know, the best investments of energy would be starting companies. Entrepreneurship. Yeah, because you would learn you learn a lot. Hmm. And it's starting a company, not just a random company, but based on the technology that yeah, you believe exactly. in. It helps but create. always broke new ground. Broke new ground. It and, and you start it, you have no idea where it's going to land up. You have some idea that it'll work, but uh, you know you know all the barriers out, out there. I think you learn a lot about. Uh, not so much about technology as much as about human beings and how society works and uh, and uh, and ultimately uh, you know today my more optimism is everywhere every every wireless uses that technology and i can claim that you know i was a big part of that and so it gives you some satisfaction too
the most best thing I've done was start companies. And, I mean, certainly Stanford was good, research and all that. But uh, uh, companies are much more challenging, much harder, uh, much, much harder. But uh, I think the most uh, return on investment, I mean, not forget money, uh, what do you learn? And what you can contribute to society, you can start to write papers forever. But when you build a product and it takes off, and, or you build a paradigm which takes off, that, that's, that's great. So once, once you got the, uh, you, you generated the idea during the haircut, uh, and then... Uh, for the over, patent. Oh, for the patent, right. And then over time, you, you were able to connect with the NSF um, Yeah, very quickly. Very quickly, you went to NSF. And my first connection was a DARPA, which we got turned down. Um, I preserved all those letters with me. <laughs> and then I went to NSF, and I got some money. Now, NSF doesn't pay much. And that okay. provided kind of the seed funding that to seed funding and demonstrate. It grew. Then yeah. it, I got it, started getting some money from industry also, a little bit of that money from industry. Uh, and, and was it a similar approach where you found sort of a visionary at some of these companies that understood your... With industry, you know, I think I would tell them, frankly, the MIMO is a little bit far off because this thing requires digital modulation, it requires... Uh, uh, it requires... I don't, I don't... I don't... I talk to OFTMA, but it requires... Uh, 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 multiple antennas and maybe a little early but there are some subsets of this idea which can, we can do quickly so I've got I've got funding around the idea of smart antennas more broadly and not only kept MIMO saying that is something to be done but in 97 when I started doing experiments I said it really works well and by the time digital had come in you know, GSM had come in and people are talking about uh, people were talking a little bit about uh, CDMA so we were into the digital world so that's then I led to start the come lots IOSPAN and uh, so, so it sort of trans- trans- transitioned well, but clearly um, uh, the idea came at Stanford. The original basic work was done at Stanford, but uh, uh, I think the interesting work of making things, you know, we got a lot of help from making things, seeing things working. Uh, we did some prototypes at Stanford too, but it's always very sim- simple. But to get a real product to work, uh, uh, that was hugely satisfying. That was in a company. And, and then how did you like kind of ta- tactically navigate the, the, the or like the first hundred days of, of, the, of the startup? Kind of. uh, you, uh, did you go on Sand Hill Road and like pitch twenty investors? Yeah, it turned out money was always easy for me. You know, the first uh, I actually had a lawsuit on my hands for not taking money, so <laughs> wow. potential lawsuit. So it was that easy. Uh, the second time also the money just walked in, so. No money is never because you're already a proven yeah. successful entrepreneur. The third time also, money is money was not never been a problem. The problem was to to make a success of the company and to and to, to execute you know there, there are always yeah. uh, differences of opinion and sometimes you hire people who turn out to be disappointing and sometimes you have to get rid of them. And all those things, you know, it's always the human factor that are the tough things, uh, tough things. Yeah, well, actually, I'm curious about that. What's your approach when you? You know, you hired somebody and you thought their potential was great and they were going to have the impact you were looking for, but it didn't work out. How, how do you how do you approach like separate? You know, the, the thing is that uh, I always played the, the, the cheeky game, but I never I never CEO. I was always CTO. I always was a CEO guy. So when it came to when it came to you know axing you know doing axing people, it was not my signature, it's his signature. Sometimes I opposed him, I would I would even once or twice I, I remember saying that I, I will res- not resign, I will give my job to that guy and uh, I wouldn't protect this guy, I don't want to let him fire, I don't want to be fired. But so I would always act like a good cop, but I knew that uh, the, real, the, the real tough person was the CEO and his job to do it, so I never had the, the problem of really facing somebody and saying, I'm firing you. So. How, I, how I took did, the easy way off. How did you find? The, it sounds like the CEO was kind of a partner in your. In, yeah, I in think you know, you know, they're always there, but uh, uh, like the CEO wasn't one of your grad students, for example. No, no, they were usually yeah. from, from industry. And, and then the, put a the venture down. venture capitalists connected. Not venture, you? venture. Um, yeah, I think the first CEO came through my venture VC firm. Second CEO came in at the founding team, founding level itself, and third CEO also. I I knew I hired him. But you know, uh, CEOs also uh, may not land up in the point. Uh, I, I knew your vision of the company and his vision may be different, also, and I've seen it happening. How did you, how did you deal with that? The, the difference. Well, you know, uh, but I would always tell everybody that 
I'm the, I'm, I started the company and I'm the last guy to put the switch lights off. So I'm going to be here to the very end. And everybody can leave, but I'm not leaving. So, uh, so, so whenever their differences fail, they're in, essentially, uh, it survived the company. Now, it may be that there were differences, but... Uh, and did you ever have a company that you started that failed? Or it sounds like every single one of your companies... I think they've run the uh, multiplier. I think the best of multiplier. I spent it really well in terms of multiplying money. Rasa was okay. Um, no, I think uh, no abject failure, no bankruptcies. No, no, no. But uh, that doesn't mean good companies can also go that way. It's just, you know, if, if at all I'm, I was reasonably lucky. You, know. you had luck. <laughs> I think we. Uh, I learned a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, you I, gave I a really great our conversation. Learned a lot about India. Learned a lot about uh, Stanford. Right. Uh, super interesting. And Stanford, you know, is a wonderful environment for uh, everywhere. It's a great university. I think it's a mixes scholarship. It does allow entrepreneurship like this to happen, and um, so it's. Uh, uh, we yeah, couldn't, we can't beat the environment Stanford provides. Uh, both, by, so it's so, so very fortunate to be here, and I had a, you know a very unusual background. I really didn't have proper, any proper education. In the Navy, you really were trained. I was trained straight away to you know to maintain radars. I never had no basic training at all, no basic foundation at all. I still thought I got it myself on my own. But from there to become a Stanford professor, you know, that was a they took a huge leap of risk on me <laughs> because I was I had nothing uh, except for that esprit stuff, and of course all the sonar and all the, didn't interest them. You know. So, so you became a professor, but you felt a little bit unqualified in a way. But you said uh, yeah, decided I, to go for it. Yeah, I mean, I think they, they took a risk on me. I, I felt <laughs> confident I will do well, uh, done well before. But uh, I think for them, I was very normally Stanford doesn't hire outside Berkeley and MIT and all that. And here's a guy from India, from Indian Navy, who really had no no proper education. Yeah, what was the thinking behind them? Like that's no, a, I think there was this Esprit algorithm when I did which I did here. Okay, uh, that was uh, that has become so well known, mm. and uh, they didn't really care what I did in India. But I think they convinced them that maybe they should give them a try, you know. And uh, within a few months, MIMO came, and uh, it turned out to be a good, a good, a good bet up for them. Yeah. So they were kind of thinking, well. Uh, we don't know about his India stuff, but if he if he builds free, he's got to be yeah, good. That, like, that's let's take a shot. Only SP is the only reason why I could get him. Yeah. Mm. And SP was very big. It did, it did entire conferences held on SP. Entire conferences. Mm. So it was, uh, and everybody would always ask, how did he come up with the idea? So different. So different. And uh, and I said, I'm, if I was trained in the U.S., I'd got my PhD in MR, I would have never done it because then you're on the group. Yeah, you don't I'm, bring I'm, outside. I'm from India. I, I was trained differently. I, I think yeah. differently than yeah, that. I think differently. Canonical. Even my mom, I think, yeah. was came because I was different. It wouldn't be difficult for people in the group to do it, I think. It, you had to think differently. That's cool. You, you kind of turned your disadvantage, in a way, to a huge advantage because you could think. I don't but Certainly, I think both these were very, very new ideas. And um, and uh, I think it's something to do with the fact I'm, oh, I'm total outsider. No, now you're an insider. <laughs> You've been here long enough. Well, I'm moving into AI now. So I'm outside <laughs> there too.